All right, good morning. You didn't sound too chipper over there. Oh, okay, that's better. I can't hear you. <laughs> like we do with the cadets. How are you, cadets? Outstanding, sir. I didn't hear that. <laughs> All right. We're in Second Chronicles 33. What's that? Oh, yeah, well, well, you know, whenever you deal with sin, it is depressing. Yeah, exactly. When you get away from the Lord, it's not a good thing. All right. Second Chronicles. 33, and we doubled down on our mystery that we talked about last week, where Second Kings just has Manasai dying without repenting. Second Chronicles 33 says he did repent, but we got the same thing here. When his son took over, Second Chronicle, Second uh, Kings 21 says that. Ammon did the same evil that his father did, and that was it. But Second Chronicles adds, he did the same evil that his father did, but he did not humble himself as Manasai had. And so we double down on the ministry here where Second Chronicles records the repentance of Manasai, and Second Kings ignores it altogether. And so uh, the ministry just... It sort of hangs there without resolution, you know, why one would record the repentance and the other would not. And so we pick it up here. We're going to do a double today. Ammon is a very short thing, and then we're going to go into the beginning of Josiah's reign. Uh, total contrast. And so Second Chronicles 33, 21 says, And Ammon was 22 years old when he became king. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasai had done, for Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which uh, his father Manasai had made, and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasai had humbled himself, but Ammon transgressed more, transgressed more and more, and then his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. But the people of the land executed those who conspired against King Ammon, and then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. So Ammon has a short two-year reign. Ammon was, grew up during his father's wicked period, and he totally embraced it. As a matter of fact, he seemed, uh, if you take a look at this passage here, seems to want to outdo his father in wickedness. Uh, he completely embraced the evil, did more and more. And by the way, that's the way sin is. You don't just do a little, you go in deeper and you go deeper and deeper. It's the way it works. It leads you down this path to destruction. Uh, Ammon did not embrace the imprint of the uh, repentance his father did. Um, again, that's not recorded in Second Kings 21. And so, even though Second Kings 21 records the evil deeds of Manasai and Ammon, they don't record anything about the repentance. Now, I want to take a little break here, and uh, there's been questions about when was Second First Second Kings written and stuff. Of course, it's a chronicle. Of, 400 years and uh, of, of kingships. Uh, let me explain what the least uh, people who study this say. First and second kings was compiled around 550 BC after the exile of Judah. 
And, it, and a lot of the records as the Spirit led came out of what this book is that's repeated over and over again. Are these not written in the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel and Judah and over? So this is a compilation or a summary. What happened is not archival. And so around 550 BC, and so this is how we got First and Second Kings. First and Second Chronicles was compiled about a century later by Ezra. And around 458 BC, we have more precise date there because it was just before Nehemiah comes and uh, builds the walls. And apparently Ezra wrote this as an encouragement to the Jews to come back. Remember, this ties into Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, or not, let me just, just you know, take some time to deal with it. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, remember in Daniel chapter 9, he had just read from Jeremiah that 70 years have passed to the time when the exile was scheduled. Jeremiah said it's going to be 70 years in the land. Dan said, well, the 70 years are up. <laughs> so, Lord, what's going on here? Then he sends Gabriel, and Gabriel not only gives them that, he gives them a scheme of whole history. <laughs> in those three verses there, 9, 24 to 27, but then chapter 10, he has another problem. He said, wait a, wait a minute, the decree has gone out by Cyrus that the Jews can go back, but not many are going back, Lord. So apparently Ezra is right says to encourage him, hey, we've got a whole history here. We've got the Lord dealing with his people. Uh, he records the, the repentance of Manasseh, he records all this. Uh, by the way, his special focus was on David. Say, so remember, we're not going back because we're just an ordinary people going back to our homeland. This, this is the heritage that God's given us, right? This is what God had promised to Abraham. This is what God had promised to David. And so, so Second Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, was written as an encouragement. Come back so that. So they're compiled about a century apart, First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Um, so Amnon, we come down to Ammon, and he had sacrificed to the carved image his father's made. Now, if we're to take this on its face value, it means that when Manasseh removed the idols, he apparently didn't destroy them. By the way, if you're going to get rid of idol worship, you need to what? Yeah, you need to destroy it. We have that weird uh, passage in the book of Genesis where Jacob, you know, put away his household idols, but instead of destroying them, he buried them under a terebinth tree. Like what? Like when you want to go back and it's like the guy wants to quit smoking, but he hides a pack of cigarettes in the house. Just what? Right, <laughs> exactly. Just in case, right? And so... Uh, so apparently uh, Ammon, after his father's death, pulls out all these images, carved images. By the way, the Hebrew, uh, when you have carved images and, and idols, uh, the difference between the two is idols are cast in metal, usually bronze, sometimes gold, silver. Images are carved. So, so that's the difference between the two. When you read idol, it's probably cast in metal. Uh, when you read the other, it's probably either carved in wood or chiseled away in stone. You know, and so, so that's the difference between the two. Not that it makes a huge difference as far as what you're doing, but I think it's kind of interesting, you know, being an archaeology major and stuff like that. So apparently, uh, in his purging, Manasseh didn't destroy the idols. Ammon brings them back out, puts them back up. And notice what it says here. He basically determined to outdo what his father did. He, he did evil what? More and more. And so Chronicles records that Ammon did not humble himself as his father Manasseh had done, which of course is not recorded in 2 Kings 21. 
He had a conspiracy of his servants to lead to assassination. Now, this probably was not a conspiracy dealing with his idol worship. This was probably a conspiracy dealing with some uh, political coup. Uh, and Judah was caught between two great powers, in this case, Assyria and Egypt. Later on, it'll be going to be caught between Babylon and Egypt. That comes into the story with Josiah. I'm going to mention that in a few minutes here. And so there was the pro-Assyrian group and the pro-Egyptian faction is probably the one that, uh, you know, uh, was pro-Assyrian because uh, Amnon tended to lead towards, uh, towards Egypt and they probably came up and they killed him. Now, after he dies, Josiah takes the throne, but Josiah is only eight years old. Uh, our son Gideon, our grandson Gideon turned eight years old Friday. I wouldn't want Gideon on the throne, although it would be interesting. Uh, uh, so it says in verse 30, chapter 34, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images. See, see the three different categories you hear. You have the wooden images, the carved images, those are probably the stone ones. And the molded images, the ones cast in metal. And they broke down the altars of the bells in his presence. And the incense altars which were above them he cut down. And the wooden images and the carved images and the molded images he broke in pieces. And made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed the Judah and Jerusalem. And he did this in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, and all around with axes. And when he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, he beaten the carved images into powder and cut down the incense altars throughout the land of Israel and he returned to Jerusalem. Now that's zeal. <laughs> that is a passion for the Lord, a passion to clean out the evil out of the land and and I think there's a good uh, example here to us that whatever is hindering us from serving the Lord, we have to have a passion to move against that and say, no, we will not do that. Now, Josiah is only eight years old and he assumes the throne. Obviously, his advisors would help him. But at age 16, in the year 632 B.C., uh, he began to realize that, hey, you know, we got sin in the land, we got to do something about it. He began passionately to seek after the Lord, and he just was determined to get the evil out of the land. And so he, he sought to do that. He sought, Josiah sought the Lord with his whole heart. Uh, he he passionately, matter of fact, in 2 Kings 23, 25, it records this, that there was no king like him before him and no king like him after him. In other words, Josiah is the crowning example of a righteous king. And so, so we have this uh, uh, example. Matter of fact, Josiah is my favorite uh, king of the Old Testament. <laughs> he just uh, really uh, put his eye on the Lord and he did not vary one way or another. And so Josiah began destroying the high places and the idols and the images and the pagan altars. He went so far as digging up the graves of the pagan priests and burning their bones on the altars before he destroyed them. He went so far as taking all the crushed idols and, and ashes of the burnt idols and, and, and desecrated the graves of those who had bowed down before him. I mean, this guy is really, you know, we're going full bore on this thing. And he reestablished the worship of the Lord and the Passover. <clears throat> now let me take a little side trip here because you say, how in the world could he go up to the northern kingdom 
when the Syria's in control. Well, let me, let me give you a little history here, background. In between 628 and 626 BC, you have a horde of people coming across the Near East called the Scythians. The Scythians were a scourge. It was like the Huns later on, a thousand years later. They came across and the Scythians uh, came into the area, nomadic people, they were from the area of the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, uh, the, the area to the east. By the way, it's amazing how many hordes we have coming across in history from the east. The, the Mongols, the Tartars, uh, you know, the Magars, all these are coming to us, these hordes coming across from the east. And so the Scythians came down and the great fear was in Judah. And one of the things that helped in the revival was the fact that hey, you know, we better turn to the Lord. These guys are coming across and they're destroying. They were not settlers. They were just nomadic tribes destroying things and, and, and coming across. And the Scythians came across and the Judeans were, were afraid. They came across the, down the coast of the Mediterranean and down into Egypt invading. And they were finally defeated by the Egyptians and then, then they left. Uh, and so the Scythians... Their descendants, by the way, were the ones that, uh, that uh, were the nomadic tribes that were up in the, um, the uh, Ukraine, the steppes of Russia, that area. And they were always a pain to the Persian Empire. They were a pain, you know, coming down, you know, to uh, the area of Mesopotamia. You know, they were just hit and run type of things. And... They were incredible, recorded in history, incredible horsemen, and they would strike with lightning speed. And so these are the Scythians. As a matter of fact, uh, they were related to the Sabaeans. Do you know the Sabaeans? Uh, they're the ones that took all Job's stuff. The Sabaeans came in, they took Job's stuff, stuff like that. So they were related people. And so um, in Job chapter 1, and so the, the last king of Assyria, uh, Ahashabanalapal, pal, um, I won't repeat that, uh, died in 631 BC. Now we're switching the power, by the way, it'll be a quiz after this. Uh, the power is switching from Assyria now to Babylon. And so we're going to be dealing with Babylon and then, not Babylon B, that's a different thing. Babylon, which will eventually yield over to, of course, the Persians, which will yield to the Greeks, which will yield over to the Romans. Okay. And so here we come. The last king uh, died in 631 B.C. Since Assyria no longer controlled Israel, Josiah was free to spread his reforms to the northern kingdom. So he went up to the northern kingdom uh, as far as Naphtali near the Sea of Galilee, which back then was called Lake Gennesaret, uh, south of the Hula Lakes. Um, and he went there and he destroyed the images there. We're going to talk about that next week when we come to the altar at Bethel. So, so hold that thought because we don't have time to cover all this. Uh, by the way, you might notice I like the historical parts of these things here. And so uh, they went to Manasai on the West Bank. Remember, Manasai was dry, divided into two. Half the tribe of Manasai stayed east of the Jordan, and half of them stayed west of the Jordan. And the one east combined on the east side of the Jordan combined with Gad and Reuben to form what was called the Gileadites. Okay? And so... Uh, he moved south into Simeon, which is in the southwest of Judah, made reforms there. He spread his reforms everywhere. He was the revivalist king of the Old Testament. And unlike many revivals, this one lasted throughout the reign of Josiah. Now, it sounds like he reigned a long time, 31 years, but really he was only 39 when he died. And... I don't want to get too far down the road here because we're going to be dealing with this later on, but let me just give you some history. How about that? Uh, this was the most complete reform since the reign of David. You know, Solomon went off the rails, Rehoboam went off the rails, 
all these, Hezekiah partially brought it back, but Josiah's reforms were complete and they were passionate. And so, so he, he served the Lord all the days of his life. This is, now listen, this is important. This is the last opportunity Judah has. Sometimes God gives you one more chance. You don't know when that is. So this, is this is it. Because the four kings that come after him were all wicked kings. Until you get down to Zedekiah and the final exile of Judah. And so this is, this is their last shot. Uh, Josiah was a shining example, right, of, of what it was to live a godly life and, and a passion for the Lord. But you see, the problem is Judeans, they followed their king, but their hearts had not changed. Matter of fact, one of the greatest indictments in the Old Testament is from Ezekiel. He's, he's, Ezekiel says, you never left the idols you brought out of Egypt. Wow. We're talking about seven centuries there. You never left the idols you brought out of Egypt. You know, these people approach me with their lips, but what? Their hearts are, their hearts are far from me. But one never knows when the Lord's giving you the last chance. It's uh, the bumper sticker that Lon Solomon mentions in his, not a sermon, where he said, many people say, I'm going to repent. Uh, the bumper sticker said, many people say, I'm going to repent at the 11th hour, die at 1030. <laughs> so, many people say, I'm going to repent at the 11th hour, die at 1030. And so, uh, now Judah, now, now, I, the, this will be on the quiz. Uh, Judah lies between two great powers. One of the problems with where Israel is located, and this is not an accident, this is why God put them there, is they're crushed between two major forces. And, uh, and they're vying for control of that whole area. And they're stuck in between. So Babylon's on the rise. Egypt doesn't like that. They want to stem Babylon's power. So Pharaoh Necho is going to come and to attack Babylon. Now, they have to pass through Israel. Uh, Josiah has become kind of a vassal of Babylon, so he, Egypt starts moving in 612 B.C. to the north. Josiah goes out to meet him. King Necho, and we're going to take a look at this later on in more detail. King Necho said, listen, why, why are you meddling? I'm not after you. He said, the Lord told me to come out and go up and strike Babylon. Well, apparently he didn't tell him to win, but <laughs> strike Babylon. It's like when Pat Robinson says, God told me to run for president, but apparently he didn't tell him to win. And so in 612, in 609 B.C., Josiah intercepts Pharaoh Necho, in the plain of Jezreel. We're going to be mentioning that in at 11 o'clock service. Why? Well, you got to stay for the 11 o'clock service and find out. In 609 B.C., Josiah intercepts Pharaoh Necro and is killed. He's shot in battle. He's he, an arrow. And he dies. Four years later, 605, uh, uh, by the way, the, the uh, 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar defeats Pharaoh at Carchemish, which is in the western part of Syria. Carchemish is one of three great battles that changed history in the ancient world. Carchemish in 605 B.C., 449 B.C., the Battle of Marathon, where we get the race named after, because Pheodipides runs from Marathon to uh, Athens, 26 miles, yells out, Nike, he didn't want tennis shoes, it means victory, then dies of a heart attack. Because three days later, he had run to Spartan and back, tried to get help. They said, we'll come after the new moon ceremony. You know, I said, well, that'd be a little bit too late. But Thermopylae, the, the Leonidas, and his 300 had held up over a million Persian forces for three days. 
The Athenians gathered at Marathon and defeat them in the Great Battle of Marathon and the Great Battle of Salamis, which is a naval battle. But I'm getting too deep here. Never mind. The, the, the third great battle that changed history in the Old Testament was Actium, where Octavius meets the forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And they defeat them, and he becomes Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. So, again, it'll be on the test, okay? <laughs> and so, at 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, after he defeats he just comes down to Jerusalem. And at Jerusalem, he starts bringing back captives. And in three waves. Now, what happens at... I should wait till next week, but this is too good. Anyway, at 605 B.C., he hears that his father, Nabonidus, has died. And so Nebuchadnezzar leaves Jerusalem to go back to secure his throne. He leaves a governor there, the governor Gedaniah. You can read about him in the book of Jeremiah. And he leaves the governor there. They rebel against the governor, so Nebuchadnezzar comes back and takes more people back in 597 B.C., including a fellow named Daniel. And again, they rebel. He comes back in 586 B.C., takes back a fellow named Ezekiel. And so, and that is the final exile of Judah. So you got all of ancient history on, on one sermon here. And so they went to exile. After Josiah dies, Judah returns to their idolatrous ways. And then their destruction is certain. You know, the Lord says, if you're not going to honor me in my land, then I'll take it away from you. Because I'd rather you be out of my land than disgrace my name. And so it comes back. Now, when they come back, and I don't want to get too far down the road, when they come back from exile, they trade idolatry for legalism. That's where we enter into the New Testament gospel. And so let's have a word of prayer. Should have a great discussion. I know there's a lot of history here, but it's all good stuff. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here. We just pray, Lord, that you just help us to learn from these tremendous events of history. We just pray, Lord, you just draw us ever closer to you, Lord, and Lord, that we will be an example and follow the example of Josiah and not Ammon, you know, as far as how it is to serve you with a whole heart. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, comments or questions? You mix me up on the idols. Who never left the idols? Who never left? Israel. Israel. Yeah, they never, Israel and Judah, they never, they approached God to serve him, but they really, their heart was with their idolatry. Yeah. Anyone else? Robert? So Ammon was 24 when he died. That means he had Josiah when he was 16, give or take. Yeah. And four years before, Manasai died. Yeah. So I wonder if had Manasai already humbled himself, come back to God during that time. So, yeah, what was teenager Ammon doing in the, in the palace? During that time, great, great. Was he already married? Was he just out sewing? You know, yeah, there? yeah. That is that that that's a fan, fantastic question. The, the the chronicler doesn't give us that timeline. It had to be pretty young, right? You know, and did uh, you know? Obviously, Josiah had been pretty young when Manasai dies. You know, but he follows the heritage of Manasai and follows the heritage of Hezekiah. Yeah, the tr Not followed, but yeah, we don't have a lot of those details, but obviously his advisors were pretty good. You know, the king that really gives us an I listen, the king that really gives us an idea of the hearts of people 
is Joash. As long as the priest Jedediah was alive, he did well. Once Jedediah died and Josiah was, uh, Joash was on his own, he turned evil. I mean, unless your righteousness is owned by you, when those props around you are gone, you're going to default to your evil nature. You've got to own your own righteousness. Uh, Steve? There's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, Christ is all and in all. Amen. You know, the Scythians are the Russians. Yeah, that's right. They're the Russians. Yeah, yeah, that, that they're uh, the Russian here. There, there's a... Well, it's almost like saying, listen, not even the barbarians. Yeah, but I mean, not even the barbarians. Yeah, it, well, exactly right. And towards the east, he mentions all those, all those people that are in the sphere of the known world at that time. The Scythians combine with the races of the uh, Cossacks and the Magyars to become what's called the Rus. That's where we get the word Russian from. And so, yeah, they, they are part of the heritage that basically becomes the Russian people. The Russies, that's exactly right. And so, and by the when you say the Rus, they say all that out there. In other words, they didn't know how far that went. Russia, even though they want more land, Russia controls one-eighth of the land surface on the planet. You think they have enough. Of course, a lot of it's... Of, of course, 11 time zones. Yeah, I mean, it's just, but most of it's barren, obviously. It's, I mean, they're, they're way above. You know, people don't realize Moscow is on the same latitude as uh, um, uh, Calgary, uh, Canada. I mean, it, you know, you know Alberta, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty far up there. Father is Ammon, and he died and everything, and he turned 16, Josiah turned 16. What made him change? What, who told him to change that made him to throw down the idols and serve the Lord? What made him change? That's a great thing. He had advisors around him. At, at some point, it clicked. Now, I had to go the path of my father or my great-grandfather, Hezekiah, and he decided that he was going to seek the Lord. So at some point in your life, you've got to make a decision. And he made that decision. The description of what Josiah did to the idols, and he ground the powder, and he dug up the... <laughs> he was the original fighting fundamentalist. Oh, he, he was. He was. I mean, the zeal, you know, over in uh, Psalm 42, where it says, the zeal of my house has consumed me. Well, the, the zeal consumed him, right? Good, Lee. Pastor, that connection you made between uh, idols and, and legalism um, is, I think, really important. I, I, mean, I haven't heard that uh, before, but I think that's really important. The Pharisees, right? I mean, Jesus teaches to beware of the, the yeast or leaven of the Pharisees, right? Because outward, they have it all together, but inside, they're just, they're, they're, yeah, we're in the Old Testament, they're worshiping idols, they're overtly worshiping idols, everybody understands that, but the Pharisees were inside worshiping their own idols, if you will, in their minds or wherever they were doing by setting up the legalism. And it's, the whole the whole yeast of the Pharisees, right, is spiritual hardness, legalism, uh, it's in the Nelson Study Bible, we've not reading that recently, but I appreciate that connection, I've never heard that. Yeah, the, what they did was trade one idol for another. And their idol says, because I keep all these rules, I'm very righteous. So it has to do about them. <laughs> Look at, exactly, the factories. Yeah, and, and exactly. And they, they, they'd pray long hours so people could see them. And when they fast, they were all haggard and everything. They say, oh, this guy's really spiritual. He's fasting. And, and when they gave in the money, make sure that a lot of people are around and they drop each coin in the, you know, into the treasury. Oh, exactly. 
Exactly. Oh, yeah, that, you know, evil hates for you to point out the evil. <laughs> they want to do it in secret. Sorry, Pastor, you keep saying things that bring a question to my mind. <laughs> Selfishness was, was basically it. I mean, oh, yeah. That basically hammers. And, and the thing is, a four-year-old can understand selfishness. Yes. Well, exactly right. It's all self-centered. It's about... It's either going to be about you or God. It can't be about both. I was just, just that thought that um, Josiah was the epitome of being led by a child. Exactly. Sure. Exactly right. You know. And let, let me make this statement since you mentioned that. Say, well, why would God take him so early? Well, I, I think the Lord, remember Isaiah 57, 1, will unto the land when the good man's taken out of the land. And so, it was like, time's up, okay? I've given you an opportunity, this is it, time's up. And, and remember, to me, one of the most intriguing passages about this is in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, where Jeroboam's child dies at eight days, because the Lord says, because I see some good towards me in him. So it wasn't this punishment on the child, it's the fact I want to spare this child from the, the evil I'm planning to do for the house of Jeroboam. So it's a blessing to the child to be taken because the Lord saw he, it's called good in him. He comes on the throne, he has no history. Yeah. He doesn't have, he's just a kid. Yeah. So there's nothing they can shoot at him about. Exactly, exactly right. You're a hypocrite because you did this over yeah. here. Yeah, I don't know what it'd be like if you're an eight-year-old kid and you're playing with Legos and he says, oh, by the way, you're now the, now the king. You know, that, that'd be, what? You know, and, and so, so that, that'd be a pretty tough thing to do, right? And when we went to Russia, no, my wife didn't go to Russia with me. In Moscow, I went through the, the Moscow Museum there. They showed the throne of Nicholas I, and he was just a kid, and they had a little hole in the back of the throne where his advisor would whisper answer through there. Literally the what? The power behind the throne. <laughs> exactly. Well, he also has cue cards. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else before we pray? Go ahead, Bethany. Yeah, the advisors, what they, they yeah, you yeah, know, they, uh, they would be regents um, and would be the, and, and that's exactly right. They, they would guide him and lead him. He would still be considered king, but, you know, he'd be led by that. Seems at age 16 as he begins to take the reins for himself. Then. No, we, ha we don't have any names that I know of who those advisors were, but some of them must have been pretty good. Yeah. Well, the problem is uh, they said that, that they killed all the con conspirators. Oh. <laughs> they killed Hammond. And so it probably wasn't them because they're dead. You know. Anything else? To me, to me this is a fascinating part of, part of Scripture.